Well, I've just been reviewing uh, an advocate of Lordship Salvation's point of view on Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. And he didn't even address that. He just went to Acts chapter 8 to prove out what Matthew 7 says. Why don't you even bother reading Matthew 7, 21 to 23? And I ended with, let's take a detailed look at Matthew 7, 21 to 23. But of course, what do you have to do there? You have to start at least the beginning of the section that's strategic, which is verse 15 through 23. And it's all about false and true teachers. And by their fruit, you will know them. Now it ends up in Matthew 21. Seven twenty-one. Conclusion. Not everyone who says to me, <coughs> Lord, Lord, <coughs> will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Taken out of context, one might conclude that declaring Jesus as Lord is not sufficient to enter the kingdom of heaven, but works are the key. Yep, there you go, cherry picking. <coughs> However, this passage is not talking about the lack of deeds as the next verse, verse 21, clarifies. The will of the Father entering the kingdom of heaven is not by works, but by a moment of faith alone in Christ alone, plus nothing else to which Scripture everywhere testifies. John W. Robbins says at first glance, verse 21 seems to be saying that the decisive difference between those who are excluded and those who are admitted into the kingdom of heaven is the difference between empty professors and actual doers of the word. <clears throat> it is not those who say, Lord, Lord, but those who actually do the will of the Father who are admitted into heaven. But Jesus does not explicitly mention belief in verse 21. He mentions doing and saying, asserting that doing the will of the Father in heaven is required to get into the kingdom of heaven, but saying, Lord, Lord, is not enough. However, but he who does the will of God relative to the reception of eternal life is he who trusts alone in Christ alone. And what is the will of the Father? What must a man do to attain eternal life? John 6, 27 to 29, Jesus answered, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him the God the Father has placed the seal of approval. Then those who asked him this, and the, the crowd of over 5,000 that, that he fed. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And what was Jesus' answer? The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Why is work a uh, believe a work? It's not. It's a play on words. There's no work to do at all. Just simply believe in the one he has sent, which he repeatedly stipulated up to this verse 629. The first 28 verses talk about Jesus on the bread of life you believe on me you have eternal life so the work that one must do for eternal life <clears throat> is exclusively a matter of faith according to John 6 27 to 29 so our Lord picks up on the word work which the disciples were mindful of and the crowd asked him about but he used it not in a literal sense but a figurative one and provided the answer which is no work at all but to simply believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, the one that God sent, faith alone and Christ alone. So, moving on, Matthew 7, 22 to 23, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out, cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So all those things that they were saying they were did, he didn't deny that they didn't do them, even miracles. But that was lawlessness. So, in view are many individuals <clears throat> who are active in performing numerous deeds, often miraculous and spectacular, all in the name of Jesus Christ, they said, yet all are condemned for practicing lawlessness. Now, the fact that many people who have done these things on earth implies several things. First, it implies that these people are not mere professors without works and without practices, we may have concluded from our superficial reading of verse 21. They are not pew warmers. They are not spiritual spectators. They are church. They are not churchgoers who show up only on Easter and Christmas. They are not those who have no works. These people have many works, and they will call on Jesus Himself to testify to their works on earth. 
Theirs is not mere lip service. Theirs is not an empty profession. They will have been very active in church and in other religious endeavors. Second, not only are these people active in the churches, they are church leaders. They prophesy, they preach, they proselytize, they teach, they cast out demons, they exercise, they perform many wonders, not just a few, but many wonders. <clears throat> these are things publicly done, not things done in a corner or in the privacy of one's own home. <clears throat> Third, they will, do, they will do all these works in the name of Jesus Christ. Notice that the defendants will use the phrase, in your name, repeatedly. They will prophesy in Jesus' name. They will cast out demons in Jesus' name. They will perform many wonders in Jesus' name. They will be leaders in profess professedly Christian churches. They are not Buddhists performing these things in the name of Buddha. They are not Hindus performing these works in the name of Shiva or some other Hindu god. Nor are they Muslims doing these things in the names of, the names of Allah or of Muhammad. Nor are they Jews doing these things in the name of Abraham. These are not pagan ignorant, pagans ignorant of the name of Jesus. They are professing Christians who will do all these works in the name of Jesus Christ. Because they were doing these things in the name of Jesus Christ while on earth, they must have known something about Jesus, perhaps even that he is God. Some demons knew no less, such as the one who, whose conversation with Jesus is reported in Mark 124. Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know you are who you are, the Holy One of God. <clears throat> Did these defendants know as much as that demon? <clears throat> they were as lost as that demon. This implies, among other things, that simply acknowledging Jesus as Lord as the Holy One of God is not sufficient for salvation. Do not the Scriptures say that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord? Do not the Scriptures say that some people will not be saved? If therefore It therefore follows that confessing Jesus as Lord is insufficient for salvation, one must also confess him as Savior. Now consider the, consider the irony of the exegetical situation. Proponents of Lordship salvation, such as Shepherd and MacArthur, appeal to this passage in Matthew 7 to support their view that belief alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone is not enough for salvation, that we must also practice the Lordship of Christ by faithfully performing works in order to be saved. Yet this passage clearly teaches that some of these those who confess Jesus as Lord and perform amazing works will be excluded from the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, one may acknowledge that the Lordship of Christ perform many miracle, wonderful miracle works and still go to, go to hell. Jesus here himself warns us that many who confess his Lordship and perform many works will go, will go, will go to hell. Obviously, the passage does not mean what the Pope, MacArthur, or Shepherd think it is. It means it is not contrast not a contrast between mere believers who are lost and workers who are saved, for Jesus himself says that the workers are lost. Fourth, because these men are visible church leaders on earth, we know that the visible church is not the kingdom of heaven, for these men are excluded from the kingdom of heaven. Let us turn our attention briefly to the sorts of works these church leaders will have done. They will have prophesied in the name of Jesus. They will have cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They will have performed wonders in the name of Jesus. Now, these are not only works, they are extraordinary and supernatural works. In fact, they are the greatest works done by men and, and among men, to use John Gill's phrase. None of us, perhaps a few of us, but certainly not this writer, has done anything remotely as great as, or as impressive as these works. Our works are ordinary, attending church, being good neighbors, giving money to the church and to the poor, taking care of our families, and so on. Now here's the question. If none of us has done or will do anything like the works these men will have done, and if these men are lost, then what hope is there for us? If Jesus himself turns these men out of the kingdom of heaven, these many men who have performed such great works in the name of Jesus, what hope have we? If, if these very active professing Christians, these church leaders, will be sent to hell, what hope have we of gaining heaven? The answer is, we have no hope, if, like these men, we rely on our works. If we believe that our works help obtain our salvation, we have no hope of heaven, no matter how great our works are. No matter how faithful our obedience, regardless of whether we act in the name of Jesus or whether we confess Jesus as Lord, if we rely on our own obedience or our covenant faithfulness or our good works, we're lost. This is the crux of the passage and of salvation. When these church leaders give their defense at the judgment, they will offer their works as exhibits A, B, and C. Their plea to Jesus will be their works, works done in the name of Jesus to be sure, but works nonetheless. And far from lessening their guilt, doing their works in the name of Jesus increases their guilt before God. 
Lawlessness, he called it. Far from teaching a message of works, Jesus warns us that anyone who comes before him at the judgment and offers his works, his covenant faithfulness, or his life as his defense will be sent to hell. Far from teaching that our works are necessary for our salvation, Jesus here teaches that all our works contribute not one whit to our salvation. Why will many men not be admitted into the kingdom of heaven? What is wrong with their defense? Jesus tells us plainly, they will plead their own lives and Christian works. What their defense should be is not their works, but the imputed righteousness of Christ. Many will be sent to hell because they will not mention that they are sinners saved only by the righteousness of the man Christ Jesus. They will not mention the perfect life, sinless death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They will not mention the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to those who believe on him. They will not mention the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ for his people. They will not mention that Jesus Christ earned their salvation for them. They will not mention that Jesus Christ suffered the penalty of hell due to them, that Jesus satisfied the justice of the Father in their behalf. This passage of Scripture is widely misunderstood. The Baptist John MacArthur, the Christian Reformed Norman Shepherd, and Paul, Pope John Paul II all misunderstand the passage, and they misunderstand it in essentially the same way. They all, Baptist, Reformed, Romanist, appeal to verse 21 for the same reason. It seems to teach by doing rather than by mere believing. After all, Jesus does that, does say that it is only those who do the will of my Father, his Father who will enter the kingdom of heaven. In his book, The Gospel According to Jesus, John MacArthur cites this passage and asserts real faith is as concerned with doing the will of God as it is with affirming the facts of true doctrine. Real faith, saving faith, according to John MacArthur, is as much about doing as it is about believing. For Jesus brought a message of works. In his book, The Call of Grace, Norman Shepherd tells us that the consequence of disobedience is exclusion from the kingdom of heaven. So a believer may be excluded from the kingdom for his disobedience because belief alone is not enough. To faith one must add covenant faithfulness, he says. <clears throat> of course, that's not in the Bible. And the most eloquent statement of the three, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1821, cites... Matthew 7:21 is scriptural support for its statement that in every circumstance each one of us should hope with the grace of God to persevere to the end and to obey, obtain the joy of heaven as God's eternal reward for the good works accomplished with the grace of Christ. How do you accomplish good works accomplished with the grace of Christ? If it's by grace, it's not by works. If it's not by works, grace is not grace. Well, well Paul wrote that. Well, back with him. Notice that the Catholic Catechism mentions grace twice in this single sentence. Many non-Catholics labor under the mistaken impression that the Roman church state teaches salvation by works apart from the grace of God and Christ, but it does not. And this paragraph reflects its teaching that the good works that Christians do are done by the grace of God and Christ. This common misrepresentation, misunderstanding of Romanist doctrine has contributed to or is caused by a misunderstanding of biblical doctrine. Our works, our doing, the Bible teaches, contribute nothing whatsoever to our salvation. They are neither an instrument for our justification nor a condition of our salvation. The difference between the Bible and Rome is not that Rome teaches salvation by faith and works without grace, while the Bible teaches salvation by faith and works with grace. The difference between the Bible and Rome is that the Bible teaches that our salvation is not, does not, does not, does not depend on our works at all, at all, whether allegedly done by the grace of God or not. While Rome asserts that our salvation depends on, in part on our works, the Bible asserts, affirms sole fide, faith alone. Rome denies that. But let us return to the text. Not anyone, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the work for the will of my Father in heaven. At first glance, verse 21 seems to be saying that the decisive difference between those who are excluded and those who are admitted into the kingdom of heaven is the difference between empty professors and the actual doers of the word. It is not those who say, Lord, Lord, but those who actually do the will of the Father who are admitted into heaven. But in verse 21, Jesus seems to be making the same distinction that James makes in 2.14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? The contrast in James is between a person who says something with his lips but does not give evidence of his faith by his works. But unlike James, Jesus does not explicitly mention belief in verse 21. He mentions doing and saying, asserting that doing the will of the Father in heaven is required to get into the kingdom of heaven, but saying, Lord, Lord, is not enough. Again, at first glance, verse 21 seems to contradict verses such as this. 
more on this next time.